At the end of the days lately, I've been taking clay that's left over in the bag and throwing larger, angular vases with it. I let them sit on my wheel overnight to dry out leather hard, and typically they're thrown from about five to seven pounds of clay. The first step, as always, is to spiral wedge up the stoneware clay, ready to be used. This process removes all the pockets of air from the clay and makes it completely even and smooth. When you're throwing on the wheel, what you don't want is a lump of clay of uneven textures and consistencies, as they'll just make the task at hand far more difficult. I take the lump of clay and I squeeze it up and down a few times, a process called coning, which sort of acts like wedging on the wheel, aligning the clay placelets and making the lump of clay a little more easy to throw. I then squash the lump of clay down into a more suitable shape and then open up the centre. I push my finger and thumb down until there's about a centimetre of clay left in the base and I can judge this distance generally by comparing the level of the clay on the inside with the metal wheel head on the outside. Although if you are having difficulties judging this, you can simply poke a needle through the base of the pot and take a measurement that way. One small hole won't do any harm and you can easily close it up by running your fingers over it or compressing the base with a sponge or something like that. Once the base has been formed, I can begin to draw the clay upward. And for the first pull, I just use my finger and thumb on the outside with the pads of my fingers pushing out from the inside. I never tried to pull too much up in the first pull. I'd rather just set course. And then for larger pots, I proceed to using a wet sponge on the outside, which isn't something I normally do. But for these, I feel like it lets me apply pressure on the outside with a lot more surface area. You also have the added bonus of the sponge staying wet the entire pull, and as these pulls tend to be quite slow, that can be helpful, as otherwise, if you're using your hands or just your knuckles, there is a chance that the surface could dry out, and when it dries out, your fingers might catch on the walls, and you'll impart some wobble or undulation into the piece, when really we're trying to keep everything as even as possible. This is why, when I'm pulling, I try to move at a nice, even and steady pace. I don't rush. I don't change the pressure of my hands too much. I try to keep everything as consistent as I possibly can. And that is certainly easier said than done. I'm not by any means an expert at throwing larger pots. I wish I was, but so much of my practice revolves around smaller pieces. And actually that's why I've been really enjoying throwing these larger pieces towards the end of the day, every day. There's something that feels very liberating about throwing a larger mass of clay as compared to the smaller pieces such as for mugs and bowls which I work with so often otherwise. I also tend not to use a sponge when I'm throwing smaller pieces. Just a knuckle will do it. That's because usually I'll be pulling the walls of the clay much faster and truthfully I do try to avoid using a sponge as much as I can as I do feel there's some kind of contact sensation that's lost as there's a barrier between my fingers and the pot itself, but maybe that's just me. Anyhow, once the height is more or less there, I'll slowly begin to pull out the walls and create the rough shape of the form. Again, this isn't a process I rush, instead I do it bit by bit. I throw the rim and then push out the belly some more, adding the angles very roughly as I go. I won't actually create the sharper angles until much later in the throwing process, when the form is more or less finished, as once those angles have been made, it can be quite difficult to revert them if needs be, or if you need to alter the pot further. But I haven't been measuring these. I just throw them more or less as thinly as I can to the right sort of shape and size, or rather until the proportions look more or less right. Eventually, these vases will have very narrow bases which isn't something I can do at this stage so easily, as if I were to throw the base as narrow as I ultimately want it at this stage. Right now, throwing the rest of the form would be inconceivably difficult, so I'd rather leave it just a little bit wider, and perhaps a little bit thicker. That way I can trim it to exactly how I want it once the piece is turned leather hard, which usually takes a day or so until it's the right consistency to be trimmed. You can begin to see the rough sections now. There's the angled base, the waist section, the sloping in shoulder, and then the rim that I'm defining now. The glazes I use react so nicely over sharp edges, so when it does come to trimming this, 
I'll turn them to be even sharper, so that the glazes break quite dramatically over them. At least, that's the plan anyhow. So now that the rough shape is there, I can begin to define the shape a little bit more, and I start just by scraping away this bottom skirt of clay around the base of the vase, and then just spend one last moment shaping the vase, in this instance, pushing out the belly so that it's slightly wider than it was before. And now you can clearly see the four different planes which make up the outside form of this vase. I then take a sharp metal kidney and I begin to scrape away the slip on the outside of the pot, further defining the shape and removing the worst of the throwing lines. In theory, the slip could be left there, but doing so would cause the pot to dry out far more slowly, and you also run the risk of the very wet slip slowly degrading the integrity of the walls, which could cause the piece to collapse, especially if it's very humid in damp weather, when pots just don't dry, which here in rainy London at the moment is exactly what's happening. All my pots are taking days to dry out to leather hard. I then take a chamois leather to the rim, smoothing it off, and that's more or less it. Like I mentioned previously, I've been letting these pieces sit on the wheel overnight. By morning, the vase will have dried out quite a lot, so I simply wire it through and then remove it. From this point on, I'll set it aside somewhere in the studio and I'll carefully monitor it and as soon as I can flip it over onto its rim so that the base can dry out more quickly, I'll do so. I can then start trimming. And for these again, I'm going to be using my brand new, well, not brand new anymore, bison trimming tools, which generally I store in this padded box so they can't roll off onto the floor. I brush some slip onto the wheel head and then place the vase firmly down onto it, rubbing it into place which actually causes it to stick incredibly well. And it means there are no lumps of clay or mechanical holding arms that get in the way. So I can trim the entirety of the outside in one go. And these sharp new bison tools make the job so enjoyable. The clay comes off so easily. And in this instance, I start out by thinning the base section of the vase, removing bit by bit. And the joy with an opening so large on a vase like this is I can reach my hand in the inside and check the thickness that way. I'll keep my left hand either perched on top, applying some downward pressure, or I'll hold my trimming hand with it, stabilizing my movements and keeping them running true as I trim. Even though it was attached firmly to the wheel, you never know when it might dislodge. So by keeping a hand up and ready, you can catch it just in case something does happen. I'll return to the base later, to finish off the foot, but for now I move on to trimming the belly, and then the shoulder, and eventually the rim. Drying these out on the wheel overnight perhaps isn't the best idea. There are drafts in the studio, and I think sometimes one side of the piece might dry out slightly faster than the other, which inevitably imparts some kind of slight wobble or undulation into the piece, as the pot leans over to the side that dries more overnight. But as the weather is still relatively cool, I can get away with it, I think, and many of the undulations I can simply trim away at this stage. For instance, if I'm trimming and I feel there's an unevenness, perhaps, I hold my tool in such a way that it only trims the unevenness when it comes around, and then I hold it in space so it travels above the rest of the pot, and when the undulation comes back around, I only trim that, and once I've trimmed it away, I can return to trimming normally. This is compared to, say, if you were trimming and as the undulation came around, you simply let your tool flow over it. With each rotation, the undulation would just get worse and worse, if that all makes sense. It's a difficult concept to explain, and it isn't a situation I encounter all too often. You can see now just how much more defined this shape is. If you've been watching my videos for a while now, you might have seen me throwing some smaller versions of these in the past, so if you would like to see how those look when glazed, I recommend going back and finding that video, as these will look more or less similar, only much larger. I then remove the pot with a knife, scrape clean the wheel head, and flip the pot over so that I can trim the foot ring. 
You may notice too the very faint chattering lines that cover most of this piece. When using grogged stoneware clay and very sharp tungsten carbide trimming tools, they can be incredibly difficult to avoid. But at this stage, I don't let them worry me too much. I could remove the worst of them later on, just with a metal kidney. I secure the pot in place with three lugs of clay, and then proceed to do the last bit of trimming on this lower section of the vase, making it far narrower than I could have ever thrown it initially. And this is how I remove those chattering marks. I simply glide a flat, quite blunt edge over them, and it seems to more or less smooth them out and burnish them over. And at the end of the day, if there are some very faint ones left, I don't mind too much, as my glazes will inevitably cover them up. Next is the foot itself. First, I trim away this beveled edge onto the bottom. This is more or less how I finish the bases of all of my pots, which aren't bowls or plates, which have more defined, taller feet, like seen in my previous video. Once the beveled edge has been trimmed in, I begin to remove clay from the actual base itself, getting rid of the wiring off marks, which I don't particularly like. I trim carefully here, and as soon as I can feel that the base bows inward even just a little bit, I know it's time to stop trimming, as I don't want the base to get too thin. I found that one of my new bison tools, the hook shape, works really well for trimming flat bases like this. I then quickly redefine this bottom beveled edge, and then I use a flat rubber kidney just to burnish the clay to smooth it out one last time. I then take my porcelain maker's mark and impress it into the still soft clay. This is my signature, essentially. This is how people can identify which pots I've made from those I haven't. Although I have seen some pots creep up on eBay with my maker's mark, which are definitely not pieces I've made, even though people seem to think they are. So if you have happened to purchase one of those, apologies, as it isn't one of my earlier pieces. And that's the vase finished. I'll let it slowly dry out now to bone dry, before I can finally bisque fire it. They change a lot once the glazes melt and flow around the shape. Sometimes very soft curves appear, edges break through and shine, almost iridescent as the iron clay and the iron glaze are reduction fired so heavily. But it'll be a month or two until I do any more firing. But if they come out nicely, I'll definitely be sharing what they look like here. And I'll keep making more and more of these over the coming weeks. Although not an interesting part of the craft, cleaning up when you're a potter is almost something you spend just as much time doing as making pots itself. It's such a dusty and muddy process, although thankfully it's a process where so much of the materials trimmed away can be recycled. In fact, almost 100% of what comes off these pots can be recycled and eventually reused to throw into new pieces. I slake down all those ribbons of clay and water and then give it a good mix up. I then take this slurry and I spread it out thickly on the plaster bats, which you can see to the left here. This very absorbent plaster slowly draws out the moisture in the clay. And after a couple of days or a week or so, again, depending on what the weather's like, of course, I can peel back this big slab of clay and wedge it up, ready to use again. Which I think is interesting, really, how reusable this material is and how simple it is too. It is just rock and earth and mud and clay, after all. That being said, as soon as clay is fired, it can no longer be recycled in this way again. You're essentially changing what is a broken down slurry, clay, which is feldspar, back into a hardened material like stone, essentially undoing millions of years of erosion. I've been asked a few times why I flatten the top out so much here, as opposed to poking holes in it or leaving it quite peaky. And the reason is I just want it to dry out as evenly as possible. Once I'm able to, I take the slab of clay and I flip it upside down so the other side gets a chance to dry out too. And I never bother to fully clean out the bucket as it's just going to get filled up again straight away. And finally, that clay is taken back up to the workbench and cut wedged until it's completely smooth and even again, ready to be thrown into brand new pots. Anyhow, that's all for this week. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you again soon.